Last time we ended up talking about Christ the man in the body that God had prepared for him, taking away the old covenant so that the new covenant could be established. I am sure if you are following this study, you have recognized the intercourse between the removing of the veil, the taking away of the old covenant, the establishing of the new covenant, fellowship with God within the veil, and the body that God prepared for Christ in the Incarnation. The place where God and man meet together, and where God dwells with man in this present phase of the kingdom of God, is within these bodies of ours. This is both an individual thing and a corporate thing. The true individual and the true church are both the temples of the living God. Corporately, we make up not only the temple of God, but the people of God, the city of God, and the kingdom of God in this world. Jesus began to teach this in St. John's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body, the idea of the individual Christian's body being a temple of God is carried on by St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 18, he tells those who would live in harmony with the worldly ways and values, quote, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers? For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, and will walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. That the church collectively is the temple of God in this world is spelled out for us in Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit that the church is God's holy nation in this world is spelled out in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into marvelous light. This is not talking to Jewish people, as some have taught, but to the Gentile church, as he goes on to say, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. It is the Gentiles of whom this is true. And it is the whole church to which it is addressed. 
That the church is the city of God, or the heavenly Jerusalem, is spelled out in two places. The first is Galatians 4, 25 through 31. For this Agar is Mount Sinai and Arabia, and answers to Jerusalem, which now is, which is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. This he said to the Gentile church in the Galatian regions. The next place is in Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 22 through 24. But ye are come unto the Mount Sion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Daniel's prophecy concerning the restoration of God's city, wall, and building also has its ultimate fulfillment in the New Covenant. In Acts chapter 15, an argument had broken out and assumed major proportions over the practice of bringing Gentiles into the body of Christ and the kingdom of God. Many of the Jews did not think this ought to be done. Paul and Barnabas went up to Jerusalem for a council on this very matter. After there had been a good deal of wrangling and disputing, St. Peter stood up and told the leaders of the church in Jerusalem about his experience at the house of Cornelius and what God had taught him in this matter being discussed. Then, after Paul and Barnabas had told of their experiences, St. James stood up to talk, and here is what he said in verses 13 through 19 of Acts 15. Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, and to this agree the words of the prophets. As it is written, After this I will return, and will build again the tabernacle of David which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. What did James say? He said that Peter had told them how God sent Peter to the Gentiles to lead them to Christ and bring them into the church. This is exactly what the prophets were foretelling, James said. St. Peter had said in Acts 3.24, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, and as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. James pins it down to one specific prophet, the prophet Amos. Amos had prophesied that God would return and build again the tabernacle of David, which had fallen down. In what sense had it fallen down? It had fallen down by the failure of the nation under the covenant of law to obtain the eternal blessings of God and an eternal dwelling place. How would God raise it up? He would do it by sending Christ in the new covenant of grace and of truth who would succeed where the old covenant and the nation had failed. This new building of God would provide a refuge for all men who would seek after God. The bringing into the church of the Gentiles was the very fulfillment of this prophecy of Amos. We may not have known that this was what God and the prophets were talking about, and they, according to 1 Peter 10, verses 10 through 12, may not have known it either, but God did. 
The redemption of the world through faith in the finished work of Christ was God's plan from the Garden of Eden on. Clearly, by any legitimate interpretation, that is not pushed around by preconceptions and sectarian biases, James is saying that what is taking place is the fulfillment of Amos' prophecy and the establishing of the church, Jewish and in the Gentile regions, is the setting back up of the house of David that fell flat under the old covenant when God, because of their evils, took the sons of David from the throne of Judah. But this is altogether a new covenant promise having to do with the church. Remember that Christ took away the old forever before the new could be established. St. Peter says plainly in Acts 29-35 through that the resurrection of Christ was the fulfillment of the promise to raise up a son of David to sit on the throne of David. Here James says as plainly that the establishment of the church and the bringing into it of men of all nations who will hear the gospel and believe is the restoring of the tabernacle of God and the wall surrounding it. The mission of the church under the leadership of Christ the King who now sits on the throne of King David is the building of the house God promised to David. Some men rush to say that St. James said after this, indicating something future. That is a begged issue altogether. It is bad exegesis that is born of hysteria in a frantic effort to find biblical justification for Christian Zionism in the Bible where none legitimately exists. St. James did not say after this, He was quoting from the prophet Amos. Amos was talking about a future event and time. James, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, interprets Amos as having said after this when he said, as it is written, after this. The time of the apostles, James, Peter, and Paul, and others, was the after this of which the prophet Amos was speaking. And the mission of the church to the Gentiles was the fulfillment of that part of Amos' prophecy that said that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. That was exactly the point that James was making by quoting Amos. Those who claim that they cannot see that in Acts 15 are no Bible students. Either that or they are simply not being honest. Now why have we gone to all this trouble about houses, temples, tabernacles, and cities of God? It is to show clearly that when the 25th verse of Daniel 9 says, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times during the 70 prophesied weeks, This prophecy has a fulfillment to the nation in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, but it also has a fulfillment in the new covenant that will be established when the covenant with the nation has been voided and their house left desolate. We will see that event taking place before we are through with our harmony of the Gospels. Now that having established, we're prepared to move on to Daniel 9.26. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So Messiah was to begin his earthly ministry with the nation of Israel at the beginning of the 484th year, which was commensurately, the beginning of the 70th week in the prophetic term. Sometime after that, he would be cut off, and his cutting off would not be for himself. This is, of course, a reference to his being cut off from the land of the living in this world. As Isaiah 53, 8 puts it, he was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. 
In other words, this Daniel passage is a reference to his crucifixion. This verse does not tell us how long after the beginning of his earthly ministry this would occur, but the rest of the passage establishes that, as do the Gospels. We shall see that shortly. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. The Messiah, the prince, when he comes to Israel, will bring with him another people than the nation of Israel. They will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now remember as we think about this that these prophecies were in obscure language that not even the prophets themselves understood. They knew it had something to do with the coming of Messiah, his suffering, and the glory that would follow, but they did not know what it was saying. They did not understand it, and they wanted to. Again, for emphasis, because this is a crucial matter in the understanding of this passage and the Gospels themselves, I cite verses 1 through 6 from Ephesians chapter 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. These verses from Ephesians 3 tell us that the mystery of Christ contained in the Old Testament scriptures was simply not known or understood by the ancients. In St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus called them things that had been kept hidden by God from the foundation of the world. It was only after Pentecost, the raising up of Christ to sit on the throne of King David, and the sending forth of the Holy Ghost, that the New Testament apostles and prophets could understand the hidden meanings of these prophecies. No one, not even the angels in heaven, knew what God had planned for the world. They only knew that he would redeem the world through the Christ, but they did not know how or how it would look in terms of a kingdom in this world. St. Paul goes on in Ephesians 3 to spell that out in verses 9 through 11. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Christ, to the intent that now, under the principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The angels are learning about this eternal plan of God which he purposed in Jesus Christ from before the world was from the church and the apostles. It was not for the nation of Israel, he said in chapter 2, nor was it for two separate bodies, one Jew and the other Gentile. It was for one body, one people, one holy habitation of God through the Spirit in which both Jews and Gentiles are dissolved as separate entities and brought into this kingdom through Christ as one new man, so making peace between Jews and Gentiles. St. Peter, the apostle to the Jews, agrees with this entirely. And we shall look at that next time, if the Lord is willing. Read more at GodsPointOfView.com. A copy of this book is available from Amazon in Kindle and paperback format. Link in the description.